morning, everybody. Um, t- um, today's reading is from Psalms 1. The Bible that you have by you is on page 543. Or alternatively, you can look at the screen or if you've got a mobile phone. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Great, so Psalm 1 today, the uh, beginning of uh, a series of psalms, uh, and well, we're going to also dip into another one of the wisdom writings. Um, so uh, there's a sort of uh, a tying together of um, the thing we've just been looking at in Proverbs, some of the psalms on these, some of these wisdom themes like the way we walk through life, and uh, Ecclesiastes in a couple of weeks' time is also coming up. So that's uh, our menu for these uh, weeks ahead. Let's pray as we look together at Psalm 1. Lord, the psalm itself talks about delighting in your law, meditating day and night on the truths that you reveal there. And we pray that uh, you would help us uh, as we have this um, 20 minutes to look at Psalm 1 together. Would the words on the page make sense to us? Would you speak into our lives, into the details, into the decisions we make, into the direction we're going? And we pray that you would call us so that we can't miss your voice, so that we can't step the wrong way. Call us and lead us. Uh, to follow you, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I guess the prayer is uh, flagged some of the themes that are in my head from the psalm. What are you like at making decisions? Are you, um, you a decisive person? Some people are, aren't they? they? They make a decision, they go for it, and they don't look back. Other people, well, you know, well, you know, they did that. Well, there's, well there's, there's so many different options. And, well, how do I know which one's the best one? And what if I change my mind? And uh, what's everyone else doing? Some of us, like me, I'm a bit of both. I'll make a choice and I'll head out with lots of enthusiasm and then think, oh, hang on, have I made the right choice? Um, actually, what were the other options? I kind of, I'm in two minds, even the, is it too late to change? Those kind of questions are in my head. Well, the past 16 months has severely reduced our ability to make any choices other than what time of day we go to the shop or go for our stroll around the block. Um, But as things open up, we will have all the old choices and some new ones come back again, won't we? How do we spend our lives? How do we spend our money, our time, everything else? Where do we invest ourselves, our lives going forward? Someone tells us that underneath all the sort of detailed choices is one huge choice that we will all make in life between two ways, two lifestyles, summarized in verse 6 as the way of the righteous, which God watches over, and the way of the wicked, which leads to destruction. Now, in some ways, you know, you think, well, come on, Steve, that's not a hard choice. (laughs) Do I want blessing and happiness or the alternative? Hmm, not difficult. But when we remember that the way of blessing is the way of righteousness, then, oh, hang on a minute, 
We've just confessed our sins earlier, haven't we? It's not easy to consistently walk the right way and do the right thing. I know I'm constantly tempted to do what's wrong. It's not just in decisions about, you know, shopping. Uh, I'm still someone who I'm basically on the right way, but I'm also kind of, oh, you know, I'm distracted. I'm tempted. I'm, oh, you know, oh. And sometimes I drift off course. Sometimes I deliberately go off course. I head off because it suits me. You know, a bit of a break from my responsibilities, a bit of a break from God. Hang on. I'm trying to describe, I think, what goes on subconsciously, but a bit of a break. And as soon as you say it like that, you think, what am I doing when I do the wrong thing, when I sin? And you see, that's the way the word wicked is being used here. It's not talking about people who are, uh, it is talking about people who are abnormally evil, but not just about them. It's not just talking about murderers and rapists and other horrendous things. It's talking about people who are having a break from God. A bit of a break or a total break. They're on permanent break from God. If the righteous person is described in verse 2 as the one who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, The wicked person is the opposite, the person who ignores what God says and does their own thing. So this is just talking when it talks about wickedness as the people who do horrendous things. Wicked people are ordinary people like you and like me. It's the businesswoman who's successful and glamorous and knows everything. She's amazing at her job, but pays no attention with whatever to what God says. It's the family man who, he is a brilliant dad. He makes sure his children are in a great school, that they're provided for, they have everything they need, but he brings them up as if God is irrelevant. That's the way of wickedness. And let's face it, that's just the way of the world, isn't it? It's so easy to go along with because there's so many people walking that way. And verse 1, it it gives a sort of three-stage expose of the way that works. uh, And it starts by talking about if we're walking in step with the wicked. Listening to their counsel is how many translations have it. Going along with what everyone else says is normal. It's just what everyone does, isn't it? And you see... That is what we'll be constantly fed by every time we turn on the TV, uh, the films we watch, the books we read, the papers, the magazine. We learn it from cradle to grave. It's at school, it's at college, it's at work. We'll hear it in the nursing home. The way of the world, the counsel of the wicked. Living life, trying to make it seem perfectly normal, not to mention God at all, not to pay any attention to him, not to listen to what he says. Then verse 1 carries on. It says, not only is there walking or listening to the council, there's also standing in the way of sinners and the lifestyle that goes with the ideas, a lifestyle focused on you and your group, whatever your group is, whether it's family or friends or your team or your tribe. It's, It's you and yours. That's where life should be, according to the wicked, rather than... God, the one who gave us life, and loving your neighbour as yourself, as well as you and yours. The lifestyle of the wicked, and standing there in life, that's the next stage. Blessing comes from recognising that pull on our hearts, that pull on our time, and saying, oh, hang on, God's calling me in a different way. The last part, uh, verse 1, it's, um, it's sitting in the seat of mockers. It could be a seat at the bar swigging a pint, or it could be a seat at a computer writing a sophisticated article for a sophisticated website, magazine, or newspaper, which is just gently looking down on Christianity. It's, it's just a bit unenlightened. It's unscientific. It's outdated. It's restricted. Uh, you know, Christians, you know, they might be all right as neighbours, but they're a little bit simple-minded and backward, aren't they? Notice the progression in verse 1. It starts with walking, keeping up with everybody else, then it's standing, a bit more settled, and then it becomes sitting. Definitely settled. 
And the natural progression in your life and mine, unless we recognize it and repent and go God's way, is that we will head towards sitting down and just sort of being slightly superior to what God says and to the Christian faith. Even sitting down mindfully, as many are doing nowadays, mindful of themselves, mindful of their circumstances, but not mindful of the living God and his call on their lives. Little or no time for him, little or no reference to him, other than just using the word God as a non-word when you're surprised or frustrated or you've hit your thumb. It's the only reference for many people to the living God. But it's mainstream. It's the way of the world. And that's why it's so tempting to either join in in, or to allow that to dilute enthusiasm for God in my life or in your life. And we're not the first people to feel that pressure and that temptation. Psalm 73, which we won't study, but let me read some of it. It, it, the, The author says, As for me, my feet had almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to people. They are not plagued by human ills. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. You see, if you look at just this life, then to be wicked, to be godless in your life doesn't seem particularly bad, particularly if you've got lots of money. Why would you need God? But if you don't just focus on the next 50 years or however long it is, you focused on reality, <laughs> you zoom back, not just to this life, but to the eternity that follows. Verse 5 of Psalm 1, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. And it describes life without God, at verse 4, when you zoom out and look at eternity as well as this life, life without God is it's like, it's like chaff. It won't amount to anything. It'll just be blown away. I don't know whether everyone's ever had a budgie. Uh, My sister did when we were growing up. And my least favorite job was when I got left in charge of the budgie. And they have this little sort of hopper with the seed in. And the budgie um, pecks all the seed. And then it leaves the husks on top uh, of the seed. And it can't get to any more fresh seed anymore. So you have to take it out, take it outside, and... Um, and blow the husk away and it goes everywhere it goes in your eye it goes down your collar it's it was my least favorite job but when I read the word chaff that's what chaff is it just blows away so easily and the psalmist says so many people will be like that on judgment day when we all stand before God. You can be physically at the top of your game. You've just won a gold medal in the Olympics. You're amazing physique. You can be a political mover and shaker. Everyone listens to you. You can be a captain of industry. You can be a household name with a massive social media following. You can even blast yourself into space nowadays. But if you do all that while choosing the way of the wicked, to leave God out, not to relate to him, to enjoy all his gifts, but to just ignore the giver, then you will not stand in the assembly of the righteous. You will be blown away from the presence of God on that final day, as if by a typhoon or a hurricane. Having stood in the way of sinners, you will not be able to stand in the presence of a holy God. Why am I so envious of the wicked? Why are we? Look then at the alternative, verse 2. The way of righteousness, it says that it's full of joy. That the righteous are those who are living in a right relationship with God. 
and wonderfully we know that that is possible. We're going to remember in uh, a little while around uh, uh, a slightly different table than usual um, the broken body of Jesus, the blood shed of Jesus is the sacrifice to pay for my wickedness, for your wickedness, for that of everyone who turns to him. God is so gracious, he'll have us all back if only we'll turn to him and repent of our sin and come for forgiveness and we'll be right again with God and in right relationship. And then he says, and he'll lead us to start walking right in the world. And the psalm is trying to help us to see how good that is, how good God is to do that for us and how good it is to walk through the world saying no to godlessness and saying yes to him and his ways and his word and his will. God watches over, verse 6, the way of the righteous. And verse 2 tells us how it is to live day by day, to wake up on a wet Wednesday and walk in the way of the righteous. Verse 2 tells us it's to delight in God's word. Word. Rejecting the way of the world in order to walk in the way of the word. Yeah, that did come out right. <laughs> and blessing comes from, from this, the, the turning away from the list of things in verse 1 that it says will take us away from God, worldly thinking, worldly lifestyle, worldly cynicism, and embracing instead what God says and delighting in it. Now, I, I, in, in life, uh, what you think of someone's words usually has a lot to do with what you think of them and whether you're interested in them. So some people in life, they hang on the words of, every, for, of a particular celebrity or a particular influencer or of every celebrity and influencer going for some poor young people who are still trying to work it all out. Um, others just think, ah, that's, I don't want to do that. I don't want to follow a celebrity through life. The person who reads words most carefully, I think, is the, um, the guy or the girl who's in love. He's, he's, he's got a text. Ooh, she's got an email. In the olden days, it used to be a letter. Uh, and you, you read, oh, you read those words over and over again. Oh, do, what does, she, what do you, does, she, does she like me or not? Is, is, is he serious or not? And the reason that people love the word of God is not because we love books, although some people do, it's because we love the one who's spoken these words, or at least we've begun to love him. And so we want to pay careful attention to what he says. What does, what does he mean when he says this? Why does he say it in that way? What does he expect to happen in my life? We want to know him. And that's why we're committed to understanding the Bible. And most of all, because it takes us to Jesus, the one who came as our savior, the one who loves us through and through, the word made flesh. And so in verse 2, when it talks about meditation, it's not meaning Eastern meditation of emptying your mind and just sort of being in the moment. It's meaning Christian meditation, you're filling your mind with God's words and going over and over it. It's the idea of uh, this, would they would meditate by muttering. You kind of take a phrase, take an idea and sort of go over it and you'd actually say it out loud as you kind of read it or remembered it and you kind of embed it and it goes in and, well... I'm not suggesting that you become a mutterer unless you already are, in which case we'll mutter about, you know, the Bible. Um, uh, but I'm suggesting that um, we do it in a culturally appropriate way, which now we've got sort of things to write on. We kind of study it, we take notes, we kind of put it somewhere, we'll see it again and maybe learn a verse or talk about a truth and talk about it with our families, wives, husbands, children, granny, grandpa. And we practice it. And in that way, God's word starts to grow in us and develop us and the result is this incredible picture in verse 3 of in the, imagining a desert landscape and in the middle of it is this lush green tree and you think well hang on how does that happen and then you walk towards it and you see it's planted by a stream of water it has an inexhaustible supply of nourishment for life. And so it grows and matures. It gets strong and stable. It's not blown around by the latest ideas on the internet. When you absorb the Bible, when it grows in you what God says, it's, you're taking a drink from the heavenly stream. It's clear as crystal. 
The Lord has planted us here. He's gone to great lengths to make sure that, this, that all the stuff that he inspired in the past is written down, uh, kept, translated, printed, made into an app for your phone so that you and I can put down deep roots into him, into his words, into what he says, so that we might live. And just like we have a physical need for water, which we do, uh, and we can't, we, we need it sort of, we need sort of often, don't we? We can't just take a drink for, and then say, right, okay, I've now had a really, really big drink and I'm all right for the next year. And we can't really do that with the Bible either. We can't even really do it with water for a week at a time. I mean, oh, oh, sorry, we certainly can't do it with water for a week at a time. You'd be pushing it. You need to drink really often. It's, it's after several days is when people start to sort of conk out if you haven't had a drink. And so it is that, uh, using that analogy, that's, that's how I think of uh, reading the Bible. I want it I want it often in my life. And so I will try it and read at least part of it each day. Um, it's why um, our midweek life groups, um, uh, I've encouraged everyone consistently uh, to be part of them. It's been great in the last year to see the way that people have really taken that up and made sure that in the middle of all this strangeness and difficulty, we were drinking some of the Word of God in the middle of the week, not just um, on Sundays listening, but discussing together uh, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And the result will be fruit in our lives. This is the true prosperity gospel. There's a prosperity gospel out there that talks about your bank balance. But the Bible's prosperity gospel talks about the equivalent of verse 3, spiritually, being true of you, of me, of every single believer. It's not saying if you have enough faith, you won't experience any desert or any storms. That's the prosperity gospel that you'll find on the internet. No, it's saying that the living God will be with you even in the desert, as we sung earlier. The living God will be beside you in the storm, even in the trial of death itself. He will be with you. That's Psalm 23, isn't it? So verse 6, there are only two ways to live, ultimately. One is the way that leads to life, the way of righteousness, delighting in God's word. So delighting in his son Jesus, the word became flesh. The other is the way of the wicked, ignoring God's word, not allowing God's word to make any practical difference to you. Whatever benefits that brings in the short term, it's the way that leads to destruction. So which way are you on? Is an obvious question to ask this morning for each of us to ask ourselves, which way am I on? Which way do you want to be on? Because Jesus has come for us all and calls us all back to him. And as those of us who are on, that, uh, that way of his grace and favor. Um, as we meditate on these truths again, the next time we're distracted, let's, next time we're tempted, let's remember not only we want to be on God's path at the end of it all, but also just remember his goodness, that actually his word, his will, his ways, they're for our good, he is good. And so we want to listen to him because he's leading us into what's good. This whole psalm is phrased as blessed are. Blessed are. He wants to bless you, bless me, lead us into goodness, lead us into happiness in our lives, lead us into that proper prosperity gospel of enjoying him and enjoying all of our days as we walk through all the different circumstances with him. That's our God. That's his way. Let's walk the next step. That's what we're called to make, each of us. Amen.